Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's great to have Mark Brackett on the podcast. Mar- Dr. Mark Brackett is founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and is professor in the Child Study Center Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. His research focuses on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, decision making, creativity, relationships, health, and performance. Mark is the lead developer of Ruler, an evidence based systemic approach to SEL that has been adopted by over 2,000 preschool to high schools around the United States and in other countries. He has published 125 scholarly articles and received numerous awards, including the Joseph E. Zins Award for his research in social-emotional learning. He is also on the board of directors for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, uh, CASEL for short. Mark consults regularly with corporations like Facebook, Microsoft, and Google on integrating emotional intelligence principles into employee training and product design, and is co-founder of OG Life Lab, a digital emotional intelligence learning system for businesses. His research has been featured in popular media outlets such as the New York Times, USA Today, Good Morning America, and NPR. He is the author of Permission to Feel, Unlocking the Power of Emotions to Help Our Kids, Ourselves, and Our Society Thrive, which is published by Celadon Books, which is also a division of Macmillan, if you're curious about that. Um, And it has been translated into 15 languages. Dr. Brackett, so great to chat with you today. You too. Thank you, Scott. Well, we go way back, don't we? We do. I was I your know. TA. <laughs> That's, that was the grand reveal. Uh, I, I was, think 15, 15, how many years ago was that? Oh my God, maybe 15 years ago. It could have been. Yeah, I think I, I TA'd for two, two of your classes, uh, Intro to Personality and Intro to Psych, I think it was Intro to Psych. But um, yeah, I remember just being in all of you, um, oh, you know, like standing in the back of the classroom there as your TA being like, oh. I hope I can be as funny as Mark someday. <laughs> you're, oh, you're well, actually you've done, you've done pretty well. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're really funny uh, and a good teacher. Um, thank you. So, congratulations on this book. Uh, we're all really proud of you. And I wanted to just open up by asking, how are you feeling? Well, you know, the truth is, this is a weekend that I'm home, and I am feeling just grateful to be in my own home. Um, I have been traveling nonstop for three months, mm. and uh, I think I did my fifty-fifth presentation on Friday. Whew. Out of you know, in the last three months, yeah. so I'm just like, it was nice to. I actually didn't set an alarm this morning for the first time in like three months, <laughs> <laughs> so I feel chill, which is atypical for me. That's great. Well, you can definitely chill on the psychology podcast. That's there you uh, go. that's the kind of vibe we go for here. None of this formal academic uh, BS, you know. Okay, good. So, um, and I also feel like that's very much in line with uh, your book and the spirit of your book, "Permission to Feel." Um, yeah. So, like, what's up with that title? Well, you know, the title came from a variety of places. Uh, the first is my own life experiences. Mm-hmm. So I had a I had a rough childhood that I never shared publicly, um, which was uh, I was abused as a child by a neighbor, mm-hmm. and you know for many many years he was actually a friend of the family, but uh, you know it was threatened that if I shared what was happening you know I would be harmed my family would be harmed, and so you can imagine what it's like for a kid who is in that kind of circumstance you know you just you're trapped with your feelings, mm-hmm. and so for many reasons I argue that I just didn't have that permission to feel. Um, I had a suppressed repress. I didn't really know how I was feeling because I couldn't talk about it with anybody. Um, and even as I got older, you know, I was bullied pretty badly in school and I had two great parents, but neither one of them would get an A in emotional intelligence. <laughs> um, so they just didn't know how to deal with their own feelings, nevertheless mine. You know, my mother had anxiety problems, so she'd have breakdowns all the time. My father was just a tough enough kind of guy. Um, so for most of my life until I turned into like so I was about 13 or 14, I just really didn't have anywhere to go with my feelings. Mm. When you feel like you were trapped in your feelings, 
Do you feel like, um, can you describe that experience a little bit more, what that felt like? Yeah, you basically are living in a fight or flight kind of response, you know, um, on a daily basis because you first, you don't even understand what's going on for you, especially when you're being abused. Um, like, why is this happening to me? Am I, is this my fault? Am I, you know, there's so many kind of ways that your brain, you know, goes into fooling itself, fooling, you know, trying to make meaning out of the world, um, knowing that the experiences are, you know, awful, but yet you can't say anything about it and you're wondering why it keeps happening. Um, Mm. And that was most of my childhood, unfortunately. Um, I just didn't have anywhere to go with the feelings and I ate my feelings, you know, I screamed my feelings, I was aggressive with people, I Mm. cried alone. You know, they have to go somewhere, as yeah. we all know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was pretty rough. Well, I'm really sorry to hear about that part of your childhood, and, and it's uh, good to see how you've put all uh, integrated, become whole as an adult, or work towards wholeness as an adult, and have used this research to help others. Um, as you know, a lot of people who are abused and young end up becoming abusers, Uh Far, far from most, but you know, it, it, it is a thing that happens sometimes. And, um, you know, um, so you have this quote from your book. You said, when we deny ourselves the permission to feel a long list of unwanted outcomes, uh, outcomes ensues. What are some of those outcomes, Mark? I think those are the outcomes that I mentioned just a minute ago. It's right. eating disorders. It's which I had, by the way, as a, mm. as an adolescent. Um, it is self harm mm-hmm. in many ways, from cutting to whatever it might be. Yeah. It's not knowing how to communicate, you know, with people around you. It's um, failing in school. I was a C and D student in school because certainly my brain wasn't in learning mode. I was in survival mode. Um, it's a host, it's just, it's basically, you know, when you think about the emotion system, how it drives our attentional capacity, it drives our decision making, it drives the quality of our relationships, it drives our mental health, mm-hmm. it drives our creativity, which you're interested in, mm-hmm. in our performance. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're feeling a lots of different feelings and don't have strategies to regulate them, life is tough. Life is tough, yes. So it would make sense that you'd be motivated to scientifically learn these tools. Um, so yeah, you cite a whole bunch of uh, harrowing statistics in your book. Um, could you mention a couple about, uh, you know, relate to how depression, anxiety, and things of that nature are on the rise? Sure. You know, I'm going to set that in context. Right. Because I think, for me, what's been so interesting, you know, with the release of my book and with the, the field that I'm in, is that you know in 1990, the president of Yale, Peter Salovey, back when he was a professor, and John Mayer published a theory of emotional intelligence. In 1995, you've got this big book by Goleman on emotional intelligence, and you've got the founding of CASEL, the Collaborative Academic Social Emotional Learning, which leads to work in schools. Then you've got in like 99, Seligman's you know launch of positive psychology and mm-hmm. happiness research and mindfulness research. And then obviously for the last 20 years, you've gotten, you know, so many consultations and interventions and experiments, et cetera. But yet, when you look at the data over the last 20 years, it seems like the world's getting worse. You know, even in the last two years, in the last two years, for sure. I mean, in the last two years, in terms of bullying and hate crimes, I mean, it's just, it's a horror show in terms of, for example, um, the Anti-Defamation League has had a 100% increase per year in the last couple of years mm. in terms of reports for you know, anti-Semitism and hate crimes. Mm. Um, but then we go into anxiety. Um, you know, at Yale and other universities, it's almost 60% of the undergrads who are reporting overwhelming anxiety. Mm. Around 40% are reporting depression. Um, in my own research, what I've shown is that 77% of the feelings that adolescents use to describe their emotional lives are negative emotions, tired and bored and stressed. Um, and the educators who are teaching our kids are feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, and stressed. So it's, there's a, 
it's strange to me, right, how we've had so much focus on social and emotional learning in schools and mindfulness and positive psychology, but yet, you know, things look worse. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you mentioned uh, Daniel Goleman and that, uh, I remember when I was in high school, that book really uh, inspired me quite a bit. Um, how has um, uh, uh, Solve, like the original model of emotional intelligence, differed? Because I think it's a common misconception. You know, there's not uh, understanding that that his model in the present that book was a broader model than the original model. Could you maybe unpack that for uh, people who want to learn the truth? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think the major difference is that you know, emotional intelligence, if you think of it as a mental capacity or an ability, right, it has to do with the way your brain uses emotions, wisely or not. So it's the, our, we define it as the ability to use emotions wisely, um, to reason with and about your emotions to achieve goals. Um, and I think when it got popularized, um, what happened is that everything that became uh, what we call non-cognitive or non-academic or soft mm. skills got clumped you know, into the space of emotional intelligence. Yes. Things like optimism or motivation or self-esteem. Everything all, good. Everything good. And, you know, and they're all important constructs. Um, it's good to be optimistic most of the time. It's, self-esteem is a good thing to have. Um, but it's not about for example, the skills of emotional intelligence, like accurately reading people and accurately reading your own emotions or understanding why we're having these feeling states or having the labels for them or knowing how and when to express and regulate them. Those are what we call emotion skills. And we like to keep them defined narrowly so that we can measure them you know, accurately and use them to make predictions about people's lives. Motion skills, good. So skills um, connotes this notion that you're uh, not necessarily born with the uh, uh, with emotional intelligence, you know, right out of the gate. That that's something that can be developed. I assume. That's my argument. You know, God only knows I was not born with you know a tool bag of effective emotion regulation strategies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I learned, and I didn't have to get my doctorate to learn the bad ones. Um, you know, yeah. somehow or another, it's like. You learn through your development all these unhelpful ones by observing the people that care for you in many ways, you know, like suppression and repression and hiding and secrecy and negative self-talk. Um, and what I argue vehemently is that we place very little attention in our families and in our schools and even in the workplaces later on on helping people to become emotion scientists, mm. you know, around their emotional lives and other people's emotional lives. So that's a self-scientist to be exploring, like, what am I really feeling? And also, um, are the strategies that I'm using helpful or unhelpful for my well-being, for my relationships, for my goals in life? Yeah, I, I like this. Emotion scientist. You have a whole chapter on that, right? And um, that was a fun chapter. Could you um, maybe just talk a little bit more about, like, you know, if I pretend, let's say I'm a teacher and I want to be an emotion scientist in my classroom, what, uh, what does that really look like? So what I do in the book is I compare the emotion scientist to the emotion judge, <laughs> you know, and, you know, in the courtrooms, fine, we need judges, but when it comes to feelings, no judgment. And so the emotion scientist, as I see that person is open to emotions, is curious about emotions. Um, wants to get granular about feelings that doesn't just accept fine or okay or like shit, right, or stressed. Um, there's deeper meaning, you know, mm -hmm. like a Lisa Feldman Barrett model of emotion granularity, right? There's, am I stressed or am I overwhelmed or, or am I anxious or am I feeling fearful? Mm -hmm. Am I down or am I disappointed or am I hopeless? Um, am I jealous or am I envious? And that granularity is important because the emotion scientist then who can help people understand their feelings can then support people in thinking about how to regulate them. Mm -hmm. And I think importantly, um, what the emotion scientist does is they're always in learning mode as opposed to knower mode. They're in supportive mode as opposed to attributor or teller mode. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that 
is that, you know, we all have biases. You know, we all have, for example, strategies that work best for us. You know, I prefer hot yoga as a way of decreasing stress. Some people hate hot yoga. It's not my job to tell somebody to do hot yoga to reduce their stress. It's my job to help you and people I care about find strategies that work best for them. So that's, that's the way I see the emotion scientist as the explorer, the investigator, the supporter, as opposed to the emotion judge who is, you know, why are you so angry? They tell people how they're feeling, right? The emotion judge says, this is the way you should regulate and that's going to work, period. My father was that way. So my father, who had a lot of anger problems, he'd say something like, this is, the way, this is how I deal with my emotions. Get over it. Oh, wow. Not a very, uh, not a growth mindset, you know, around emotion regulation. No, not at all. Um, yeah, no, that's not very, very helpful of a response. And, um, you know, your uncle uh, was really someone who inspired you. I mean, didn't, didn't he literally say, like, you have the permission to feel? Like, didn't he use that title? Of your book? <laughs> no, he didn't use oh, that. Okay. But um, I mean, I got the title. I can share that with you in a moment from a specific uh, experience that I had teaching emotional intelligence. Oh, okay. But um, what I argue in my book was that my uncle gave me the permission to feel. I see. Because uh, he was my <laughs> mother's brother, and he was just an amazing human being. He was a band leader in the Catskill Mountain Hotels by night and a middle school teacher by day. But Uncle Marvin was, you know, way before there was a theory of emotional intelligence or the field of social emotional learning, he was developing a program, literally in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, to teach kids about their feelings. He wanted to redefine the way we taught history through the lens of emotion. And it was amazing what he did. And he came at this idea because he said, you know, when I'm playing my trumpet in the evenings, you know, everybody's feeling it. They, you know, these gigs, everybody's dancing, their eyes are closed and they're having a great time. And then I get up at seven in the morning and get up from my, you know, 8.30 social studies class and all the kids are like, <sighs> and he's like, why is it, you know, that they're not feeling it in the classroom? And he thought that emotion was the missing link, mm. that they just weren't being brought into the learning process through feeling. It was all through rote memorization. And so what he wanted to do was rewrite the curriculum to be based on the character's emotions, and then relate those experiences to the students to then get them involved in the learning process. And by some wave of a magic wand, he was going for a master's degree when I was going through all my trauma as a childhood. Mm. Um, and he would stay at my family's home, and we'd have these just amazing conversations in the backyard. You know, and what I say in my book is that he was the first person to say, you know, Mark, you know, how are you feeling? And he did it through the lens of the emotion scientist, not the emotion judge. He didn't say toughen up or I'm going to have a breakdown from what I'm hearing. He said, well, what can I do to support you? And, you know, it changed my life forever. Yeah, I imagine. I, I believe it. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Maybe it's, if you don't mind, we go into the specific rule or skills. Sure. Um, starting with recognizing emotion and also how do you like, how did roar, you know, like hit you? Like, did you, did you come up with roar first and then fit everything into that framework or did you the other way around? I hope the other way around. But. No. So, you know, as someone who was a student of the theory of emotional intelligence or a student of Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer, um, who were the founders of the theory, um, you know, I read all the work and I, you know, obviously spent my graduate school year studying these things. And, you know, they had a four-part theory, which was around perceiving and mm -hmm. using uh, and understanding uh, and regulating emotion. And I just realized, you know, through my, um, my work with that and through reading other theories that maybe we could break it up a little bit mm -hmm. more um, specifically. And so when you think about, you know, making sense out of your own and others emotions mm -hmm. oftentimes you don't you you can't label things immediately you know you have a tool like we have called the mood meter um mm -hmm. you know which is based on the circumplex model of emotion which you know says basically that you know we can define our feelings through this pleasantness or valence or arousal or energy factors 
And that, you know, the first thing that happens is that we are in a room and we, do I feel like approaching this or do I feel like avoiding this? Do I've got the, do I feel like I can thrive here? Or do I feel depleted? And that's, when I talk about recognizing emotions, I mean it at that level of core. It's like this visceral sense in the moment. It's before you label it, it's before you even know why you're having the feelings. And at that point in time, you can say, you know, I feel energized and pleasant. What's going on? Oh, I'm on the podcast with Scott Kaufman. Um, so, oh, I'm, I'm Scott excited. Barry Kaufman. I'm Scott Barry Kaufman now. Scott Barry Kaufman. I'm sorry. You're right. Um, and right, there's another Scott Kaufman, right? Um, and um, so I'm feeling excited. Um, so that process of recognizing, you know, the kind of core affective state mm. to then attributing it to something that's happening or has happened in the past or will happen in the future. And then using that information to then, okay, so I'm anticipating positive things. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, I'm anticipating I'm going to get hurt. Oh, I'm fearful. Mm. Oh, I'm anticipating I'm not going to know what the heck's going on. Oh, I'm anxious. Mm. And so that's the R, the U, and the L of ruler. And in the beginning, they're kind of separate constructs. But in the end, right, the R, the U, and the L kind of go together mm. um, to help us identify our feeling states. The E and the R have to do with what we do with our feeling states. So what that means specifically is, firstly, you know, do I have the permission to express my true feelings with you? Do I feel safe? Do I feel supported? Do I feel valued enough to do that work? Um, mm -hmm. And that's very contextual, meaning um, homes and schools and workplaces uh, create different rules around expression. Uh, expression is based on culture and race and power, and gender. There are so many factors that influence whether or not we express our emotions authentically and honestly. And then I have to know how to do it. I have to learn how to communicate effectively to get my needs met. And then finally is the last R, which is the regulation of emotion. So those are the strategies that we use to prevent unwanted emotions to reduce difficult ones, to initiate ones that are going to be helpful, to maintain ones, or even to enhance or boost emotions. And so that's the rule of framework. Nice. I like it. <laughs> I like it. And I like the mood meter. You have the mood meter in your book. And when you, op when you open it up, I love that. Do you recommend that people... Um, like buy it. Do you sell like a mood meter poster that people can buy, you know, and like put on their walls? We have posters. Um, you can photograph the book if you like. Um, there's also a mood meter app okay. that is downloadable that allows you to track your emotions over time and uh, look at patterns, which is really cool. Would that be a good sort of first date um, thing to pull out the mood meter app and a good starter icebreaker? Um, I guess it depends how you're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> or how you think the person you're dating is going to feel. Yeah, I didn't really think that through. <laughs> yeah, that's, that uh, one you need to do that one. Maybe a second date. <laughs> yeah, so you second date because I know there's the um, there's an app for the um, the ten questions or whatever is that you, to fall in love with each other. There's like escalating questions that the Aaron's came up with, and there's an app for oh. that too. That might be more appropriate. <laughs> there but, you go. I don't know. Just a quick break to let you all know that this episode is sponsored by Learning and the Brain. Learning and the Brain's mission is to connect educators to the latest research in the science of learning through education conferences, summer institutes, one-day seminars, and on-site professional development. I've had the great pleasure of speaking at several of their conferences already, and they always have an amazing array of presenters. Many of them are leading national experts on psychology, neuroscience, and education. If you're an educator interested in the brain and using the learning sciences to improve your school, classroom, or practice, this is the conference for you. Learning in the Brain runs three conferences a year in Boston, San Francisco, and New York City. I'll be at their May 2020 conference in New York speaking about transcendence and self-actualization, and I hope to see you there. To find out more about Learning in the Brain's upcoming conference in May 2020 and any of their other events, please go to learningandthebrain.com. That's learningandthebrain.com. Okay, now back to the show. 
Um, yeah, so let's talk about individual differences for a second. Um, is it harder for some people, you know, to develop this than others? I mean, surely some people start off already with um, a higher level. Well, I think this is where it's, you know, this the construct um, clarity is important. So, for example, I, uh, in the personality literature, would classify myself as someone who has high neuroticism. Hmm. Uh, even meaning, so, even still. Definitely. Oh, okay. You know, I worry about everything. I worry about why I worry. I even have, I even worry about why I worry about why I worry. Um, even though I don't really have very much to worry about, I'm living a great life right now. But, um, you are, you know, the default is, you know, something might go wrong. Um, thank you, grandpa, for that, that language. Um, I had a grandfather who was like, you know, we'd smile and we laugh. He goes, you'll laugh now, you'll cry later. <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> the optimistic Jewish heritage. Um, but my point is that for years, I um, I conflated my proclivity towards experiencing strong emotions with my skills at dealing with those experiences. And I think that what our research shows is that they're separable constructs, right? Just because you are someone like myself, potentially, who, you know, is a little bit moody and you're easily startled and, um, you know, ups and downs, um, that's your experience of emotion. It's not your skill, right? It's your temperament, your personality. And I think for a lot of people, they think their temperament is their emotional intelligence. I see. And it's not. You know, as a matter of fact, potentially, someone with my level of emotional volatility might even be have the opportunity to be higher in emotional intelligence because I have to be so self-aware and and regulating more frequently because of those ups and downs to you know make sure that I'm you know leading properly or you know dealing with my partner properly or um, you know achieving goals. So um, does that does that make sense to to separate these two things? Well, it absolutely does make sense. But I think that um, even I could still uh, come back at you and say, well, well, even uh, if you're separating the personality big five domain from the emotional intelligence skills, there still are some people that are more intuitively higher on the emotional intelligence skills. I mean, they're they're surely not all 100 percent developed. There's there's a genetic component, uh, uh, no doubt, to even those skills, right? I would say that the, the genetic component comes in primarily in the perception area, right? Because we know that um, people on the autism spectrum have more difficulty, for example, decoding facial expressions, um, engaging in that awareness piece. But when you get into labeling, I mean, we have to be taught the feeling words, right? You just, no one is born with like the granularity around anger, like am I peeved, am I irritated, am I angry, am I enraged, am I livid? You know, am I happy? Am I elated? Am I ecstatic? Or am I just calm, tranquil, peaceful, relaxed? Uh, no mm. one is born um, knowing the nuances around expressing emotion, right? That you have to, you, it's like, it's a real interesting discernment that you have to build over time to know. Like, you ever notice that? Like with certain people, you feel like you can just open up, Yeah. you know? And with other people, you're just like, I'm not going to share anything. Um I hope you feel like you can open up with uh, with Scott Barry Kaufman. Scott Barry Kaufman, SBK. You know what? You're 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 getting everything today. <laughs> Yay! Um, and um, so like that's a learned skill over time. By you know, it's like a trust factor. It's a relationship factor. Um, and then the regulation piece. You know, yes, we're born with some kind of innate desire to soothe oneself, you know, whether it be, right, the sucking the pacifier or breastfeeding, you know, um, or breathing. Um, but the cognitive strategies, right, they, it's, it's, they have to be learned. And, yeah. they're, and they're really hard to learn um, because, you know, we have a negativity bias, you know, and mm. um, oftentimes our negative self views are defined by the people who are the closest to us, right? Like our parents yeah, or our peers when we're young. 
So, you know, I'm, I really push for the fact that, you know, the, um, the skills really are primarily learned and developed through different contexts. Um, and they have to be practiced and they have to be refined and they have to be evaluated over time. Well, that's great news for the work you do or else uh, no one would pay you money <laughs> to do anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, also, I mean, of course, if you have high trauma in your childhood and your stress response is so high because of a victimization and without intervention, right, it's going to be harder for you to regulate than other people. So I don't want to you know, deny the fact that there are circumstances that certainly make it harder for certain people to learn these skills. But I do believe that with the right person and the right, you know, the practice, you know, they really can be developed. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find videos of many of these conversations. Just search for The Psychology Podcast on YouTube. Third, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Finally, if you really want to show some love, you can donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, you've done a lot of work to bring emotional intelligence trainings to schools nationwide and even internationally. Um, can you talk a little bit about what those programs, what, what are some of the nuts and bolts of those programs and what you've learned in the process? Yeah, I think the number one thing that I've learned around teaching emotional intelligence is that the kids are mostly all right. It's the adults who are raising and teaching kids that have the issues. Are a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that seriously. You know, when I first started doing this work in the mid-1990s with my uncle, because what happened is that when I graduated from college, I was an anxious mess again, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and I was in therapy, and that's when Dan Goldman's book came out, and that's when I learned about Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer, and that's when I realized that everything my freaking uncle was doing back with me 10 years prior, 15 years prior, was actually this stuff. I called my uncle, who was then retired, and said, let's write a curriculum. Nice. And we did. Um, and that was back in 1995, 96, um, which then got me into grad school, et cetera. But what Uncle Marvin and I did was we tried to take everything that I kind of knew about psychology, which didn't know, and everything he had done for many years as a teacher, and we tried to package it. And we did. It took us about five, six years to do it. But nevertheless, we did it. And then we went out to schools and we tried to deliver it. And we just had so much resistance. Mm. Like, my job is not to talk to students about my feelings. Um, you know, I'll do joy, jolly, and cheerful, but I'm not talking about alienation or despair. Um, principals would say things like, well, we, can't, we don't have time to do this until after the state tests. You know, I was like, well, this is, we're doing the training in August. Like, the state tests are in April. So, like, what am I doing here right now? Because you're not going to even remember what I taught you. And so I learned quickly that really the hard work was getting the adults to realize that this was really important. And then we had more success. But again, we had to go even further up the leadership um, ladder because what we learned was that principals of schools, if they weren't supportive of the teachers and doing the work, it would never get done. And then we were asked, like in New York City, can you do a... The, the, the director or the superintendent of special education said, can you bring this to 350 of my sites across 57 schools? I was like, Ugh. and how do you do that at a systemic level and have sustainability? So we learned that really when you get down to it, if you want social and emotional learning or emotional intelligence to be in a school, 
it has to be weaved into the way leaders lead, the way teachers teach, the way students learn, and the way families parent. And that's when we found great things happen. Well, that is easier said than done. <laughs> you, <laughs> yes, it is. You must have. Uh, I mean, it takes a it takes a whole. You have a, uh, it takes a team. You have a quite a big team. The Center for Emotional Intelligence. We do have fifty about fifty six people. Fifty six. I I know. Um, I'm I'm friends with a lot of them, like Emma Seppala and uh, Zarana, yeah. if Ivkovic Pringle. Yep. Um And um, you know. You do you, you have people you have people who are training like who focus primarily on the internationals like do you have people living internationally that are part of the center? We do. They're mostly consultants, but we are now building a whole um, approach to ruler in China and Italy and Spain, Australia. Wow. Um, we have lots of interests. World and, domination. <laughs> no world permission to feel. <laughs> I, I know. I, I know. <laughs> Um, remember, the scientist doesn't want to dominate. The scientist wants other people to develop it. Um, that's what the scientist says. <laughs> I know. Well, that's what I want. There's some scientists that we both know that maybe want the other. I know. That, that's a wink, wink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so it's exciting. Yeah. And obviously, we have to be mindful that there are cultural differences. But um, we've got a great team who are doing everything from basic science and emotion to interventions to. Mm skill development and assessments, and the list goes on. Yeah, you seem to just have this endless uh, energy and, th- and enthusiasm around this. Like, I mean, I, it, hasn't, it hasn't changed since 15 years ago when I knew you. You, were, you had the same sort of like passion for this particular time. Do you ever get bored with it? Do you think you'll ever get bored with this? Be like, you know what? I'm over emotions. <laughs> I'm going I'm to move on to like something else. <laughs> well, no, because I'm just endlessly fascinated yeah. by how emotionally stuck people are yeah. and how much resistance there is to this work. And also, you know, I'm a, I'm a proponent of, of divergent thinking and creativity. Mm. So, you know, I'm always exploring more innovative ways to get people to take this work seriously, you know, and that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Because I needed to just like sit with the material for a little while on my own, sure. as opposed to be running around. And now that I have this thing, I'm going out there and I've done 55 presentations, like I said, in the last couple months. And just bringing this out into the world, I start thinking about like that emotion scientist piece a little bit differently. You know, I'm I'm really interested in why um, why there's so much resistance to emotions. You know, the, in the workplace, for example, I do presentations for big, you know, companies, pharmaceutical companies, or healthcare companies, or you know, the uh, investment world. You know, and you know, it's just the the prevailing notion that emotions are weak um, is fascinating to me. You know, that people don't realize that everybody comes to work with feelings, but yet. It seems that the more money you make, the more you think that you can just suppress them because, you know, money talks. Mm. But yet, why are so many people getting divorced and why are so many people, you know, so unhappy? Well, that's that right there is a very good question. <laughs> and you think a big part of it is this, uh, they're not giving themselves and others permission to feel. Um, so you have this. Uh, I mean, you really do think that the permission to feel is 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 going is a game changer. You think you say there the less stigma, racism, um, and a third grader said to you that there would be world peace. That's right. Um, wow. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, that's I, pretty I, serious. I, I'm a, I, you know, I am. A, I'm still a professor, so I can't. I'm not a, just a journalist, so I can't make those audacious claims. <laughs> but a third grader can. <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I do really believe, you know, from both the science that I've done and honestly, I've done, you know, I've been in the real world quite a bit. You know, I'm not a traditional scientist, you know, that locks himself up in the ivory tower. You know, I'm, I spent a good half of my life, you know, with people, with kids, with teachers, with leaders, yeah. um, kind of seeing how this, you know, plays out in the real world. You know, and we unfortunately have created a society where there is tremendous amount of angst, 
where people think that talking about feelings is weak mm. and where people are not learning strategies on how to deal with their feelings. And it's not a good sign. It's just not. And even in my own organization, I see it, you know, at, at the university, you know, and I think it's because, you know, this is one of my favorites is that when I teach my course, you know, students come in thinking they're going to have to memorize the 1990 theory or the bracket paper in 2003 that showed the correlation coefficient between emotional intelligence yeah. and satisfaction is 0.35. And I tell them, like, honestly, you know, I don't even remember those coefficients and I wrote the freaking papers. Um, but what I want you to do is learn the skills. And they're like, but that's not, that's the, how do I get an A in that? You know, and I said, well, don't worry about the grade. Like, this is not a course about grades. This is a course about building awareness and, you know. And then they start pushing back and saying things like, well, you know, Professor Brackett, I didn't need emotional intelligence to get into Yale. Oh, gosh. It's probably and true. And then I say, well, I, it is true. But then I say to them, well, you're going to need it to get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean that seriously because... I mean, most parents, when they are thinking about their kid at 25 and 30 years old, they're not saying, oh, I hope my kid graduates Yale with a 4.0, right? They're saying, I hope my son or daughter has purpose in life, you know, is passionate about something, find someone to love, you know, et cetera. Um, but yet we spend no time cultivating that. And you really can say uh, from the front lines that you see notable changes, really substantive, large uh, effects that give you hope that, uh, that we can change. Well, I see that there's a stronger desire than ever before to do this work, that people are finally recognizing, like, if we don't do this, I don't know what's going to happen. However, because we're a nation and just a species who wants quick fixes, I think we're going to continuously fail until we understand that this has to be a strong part of the way we develop children. Mm. And, you know, because, you know, what makes me annoyed is everybody now thinks mindfulness is the answer. They do, right? yeah, that's it's, true. It's the answer to everything. You just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything, you just breathe it out. And I'm like, I don't know. I've been going to yoga for 15 years now, 20 years. It hasn't changed my, you know, like my envy of certain people or my feelings of being overwhelmed half the time. Uh, and does it help me kind of like be more present? Yeah, for sure. Um, does it help me kind of reduce a little bit of my stress? Yeah, right afterwards I feel fabulous. But the point is, is that that's, a, that's like a one-shot wonder kind of strategy, right? Yeah. And same thing with yoga. Everybody thinks like yoga right, you know, is the answer. I'm like, guess what? Downward dog doesn't solve all your problems. <laughs> uh, I've said that too. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. funny. And, you know, and just so like there's exercise that you have to do. There's good eating you have to do. There's good sleep you have to do. And I think so much of it has to do with more top-down strategies, which are these more cognitive strategies, you know, that we have to change the way we view ourselves and view the world. And, that takes enormous practice. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to end this uh, interview with this quote uh, from your book. We need to launch an emotion revolution in which the permission to feel moves us in ways we have yet to imagine. Dot, dot, dot. Emotional skills are the key to unlocking the potential inside each of us. And in the process of developing those skills, we each, heart by heart, mind by mind, create a culture and society unlike anything we've experienced thus far and very much like the one we might dare to imagine. Mark, you still got it. Uh, oh, you still that. got it. You still got the humor, the sensitivity, the compassion, and the pa uh, and the passion. Um, and uh, thank you so much for uh, finally being on my the Psychology Podcast. <laughs> I'm excited to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes 
and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. In fact, many of these episodes are in video format on YouTube, so you'll definitely want to check out that channel. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. Thank you.